Unfortunately, my active Spanish is very restricted, you know, so I can read very well, but uh, unfortunately I can only express myself a uh, small bundle of very elementary words, so I will not bother you uh, with uh, my Spanish trials. Anyway, um, I will uh, try at least to express myself in English as uh, it um, will happen. And um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, uh, Paz Vidito, uh, who is not there <laughs> just now. He's coming back. Yes, yeah, coming back. And uh, Jose Maria, of course, in the first place, who have uh, to, uh, took the effort to organizing the meeting and inviting me and all that sort of thing. And um, so uh, what I will do is uh, to give you uh, a small impression about uh, the basic aspects of uh, systems. Um, after a short introduction, uh, I will uh, simply uh, divide all of that into four sections and so we will, um, uh, we will uh, talk on the elementary properties of systems in the first two sections and then I will uh, clarify the specialized uh, approach to cities or to urban uh, uh, structures as to that and uh, in the end I will show you the limitations of that approach because um, obviously there is a special relationship between uh, the physics of the model and the metaphysics so to speak and uh, we will try to clarify all these aspects in some more detail. Um, uh, first of all, uh, in, in technical terms, I should um, guide your attention to uh, the lecture notes. Um, I will closely orient myself in terms of these lecture notes, but of course I will not tell you everything what is in there, because there is written much more than we are able to uh, cope with. Um, it's actually the first part of a book project um, and this project is called Metaphysics of Emergence and uh, in the first part it's covering the theory of systems and uh, I think that uh, you can find uh, on the website a link such that you are able to uh, download uh, this uh, paper uh, as a PDF file as far as I know. Uh, <coughs> it's it's here. Here. So it's here. I think I send you a, an email did you receive? Maybe at least a few people were and here so so the this this book this book is a theme of system theory. Okay. Yeah you see here the uh, more yeah, well that is too weak actually. Um, uh, you see here the uh, three original papers uh, dealing with the uh, city project um, in closer detail, but uh, this is actually incorporated partially into uh, this lecture note and um, the first part of it, the introduction, um, where I actually explain the necessity of having a metaphysical approach also, uh, this you can actually um, see in the interview Jose Maria has done with me in Munich last year um, and uh, you have that in the announcement for this meeting so that you can uh, uh, have a little YouTube video there and uh, this is actually dealing with the introduction to this text so that uh, now I will not actually talk about this uh, anymore but I will start with the introductory remarks to the first part, which is actually dealing with systems. Beside that, uh, during the last uh, two years, approximately, um, a number of papers has been published, uh, joint papers by Jose Maria and myself. Uh, I think uh, uh, three or four of them, I've actually forgotten how many. Um, but uh, uh, you can find the references uh, quite easily in the 
internet and you can also download all these papers as PDF files so it's not a problem to access uh, this information in fact very quickly. So um, now what I uh, should say is that I'm very happy that uh, uh, people from, very, uh, from countries very far away from uh, equatorial countries are actually coming to this meeting and um, speaking about the equator I would actually start with a little example in order to uh, get a feeling for the problems we are actually encountering here and somehow it's actually related quite closely to that uh, famous uh, tree of uh, Ramon the Yul. So, um, oh well. Here we are. So you might know that uh, the equator is actually a very particular line in the coordinate system, which is not by chance called actually coordinate system, although it's a different type of system we are talking about. Um, now, if you have here our planet, you know, um, I approximate this in uh, slightly artistic terms, so that this is the North Pole and this is the South Pole. Then uh, you have a whole collection of particular lines, which are called grand circles or uh, meridians, in fact, in the longitudinal direction, while in the horizontal you have only one single line, and that is the equator. And all of these lines are called geodesics. Uh, in the sense that they are extremal curves. Uh, in fact, they should be the shortest curves, but in the case of our planet, they are actually the longest curves. But this is uh, because um, our planet has a particular form of curvature, so it's actually um, the surface of a sphere. But of course you know by yourself that if you're walking uh, around, and uh, not uh, to mention mountains and all of that, but the global curvature you cannot actually observe. Yeah? So this is the reason why most uh, people in the past have thought that the Earth is actually flat. Um, in fact there are some people around nowadays who still think uh, the Earth is flat, but we will neglect these. So, uh, the point is that by reading the geometry of the geodesics, um, by simply looking at qualitative properties, such for instance uh, the fact that while they are approaching the equator, they are expanding in the sense that neighboring lines are diverging. Yeah? But if you're approaching one of the poles, then obviously neighboring lines are converging instead. Yeah? And uh, simply by looking at this qualitative property, you can conclude results about the topological structure of the body you are actually walking on, so that this convergence of uh, and divergence of neighboring lines, of neighboring geodesics, is actually giving you a lot of hints as to the topological figure of what this body is all about, so that you can imply that you're walking on the surface of a large sphere. But, however, although this is called the coordinate system and it's very useful for practical purposes, however, it's an invention. Yeah? It's arbitrary because you could also choose other places as poles. So, of course, it was simply practical to do it that way because near to the geographical poles you have other types of poles which are magnetic and that was very useful, you know, for orientation. But 
in geometrical terms, it doesn't matter at all. So you could choose any other system. In other words, the coordinates you are using are practically passive because they do not deal with what is happening in physical terms. So for instance, if you approach one of the poles, which in mathematical terms, once you are describing the coordinates, is a singularity, yeah, meaning that is an undefined point in the mathematical system. Nevertheless, if you approach this point, the North Pole or the South Pole, you know very well that there is no hole or something like that. Yeah? In former times, people thought there is a hole, and these two holes are actually communicating uh, together, you know, like a kind of uh, big thermodynamic system. But this is obviously not true. But um, what you see is that in physical terms, uh, you have certain conditions you can observe once you are at the point, but while describing it in mathematical terms, the representation is quite different. Yeah, so the coordinates we have here is a representation of what there is, but this is not identical with what there is. In physical terms, there is something else which does not actually deal with what you represent. So, the point is that this is very useful and practical and we are utilizing it all the time. We can even think of relativistic corrections in order that your GPS is functioning in your car and everything, all of that, which is in fact very complicated physics after all and mathematics, but nevertheless, what we do here is not dealing with reality and we say instead it is dealing with modality. Modality means, uh, that is actually a definition going back to Spinoza. Modality is what we observe, but reality is what there actually is. But unfortunately all what there is we cannot observe. Yeah? Why? Because the means of observation, yeah, human perception, is limited and restricted. And you know that by yourself, I mean, we can obviously see many things by our eyes, but as you know very well, uh, the optical spectrum of uh, visible light is just a very tiny inter interval in the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation which we cannot actually observe directly. Yeah, and the same is true for acoustical means so that we cannot hear everything what there is. Actually each dog is hearing different things yeah, because dogs can hear in different uh, frequency intervals um, not to speak of bats and other animals. So, in fact, what you have to do in the first place is you have to differ between reality and the representation of reality which is called modality and modality is explained in terms of the mode of being, yeah? that means the uh, set of properties of human beings which enable them to observe things. But that what they observe is not altogether wrong, obviously, because human beings are a part of reality, but they are only a part of reality. That is, they can only perceive a part of reality. And so obviously, because what we know is incomplete, we cannot expect that we are telling the truth. What we do is, we are telling part of the truth and we are happy if that functions. Yeah. So that is a kind of, say, metaphysical background of what we are actually doing because reality as it really is independent of human beings is a metaphysical difference as compared to modality which can be actually observed. And in everyday language, we call modality actually the real world, you see. Reality in everyday language means that this is what you can see and hear. 
but um, in philosophical terms, that is only a tiny part of what that actually is. So, um, uh, this I would like uh, to have as a kind of, uh, say, uh, red line going through all what we say uh, during the next days. And uh, you have to bear that in your mind because <clears throat> in order to decide what you are doing with what you know, after all, this depends very much on the consciousness you have of that difference between reality and modality. <clears throat> so, um, um, I thought it would be practical if uh, while I'm talking I'm showing you from time to time some excerpts from the lecture notes so that you can relate this in optical terms. Of course, it is not a PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation because I've taken it directly from the lecture notes, but it should suffice and uh, serve the purpose as far as I can uh, see. Yeah, if you would uh, take the Koigia exemplar. Okay. Perhaps, um, perhaps um, I give you another second example in order to show you the line of argument. Was uh, uh, is one kleiner? Ah, yeah. Also, ich mache es gleich dann noch auf. Ah, das habe ich nicht. Ich bin ein kleiner. Äh, <lacht> oben, oben rechts. Moment. Da oben rechts. Was ist? Das ist. Das muss doch hier oben. Das muss das Kleine machen. Ah, das ist das Kleine machen. Ja, 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 genau. Ah, so, okay. So, jetzt machst du mir erst also die 1. Ah, okay. Von den D2. So, um, <coughs> yeah, this is, uh, yeah, perhaps we can enlarge a this a little. Um, so this, um, this was the first example as uh, to the difference of reality and modality, talking about representations, which will be one important point later on. The second example is actually a work of a painting. It's an art, artist uh, in question here. <coughs> And uh, perhaps you have already heard of him, uh, <coughs> that is a painter um, of the name of Mark Lombardi. Unfortunately, he died already uh, a number of years ago, in a very young age. And uh, in fact, until today, it's not quite clear whether it was uh, really a suicide or uh, whether somebody has actually helped or that. Um, and you will see in a moment why. Because Lombardi had a particular type of painting which does not actually look like a painting, it looks like a network. And we will talk very much about networks these days. Now, um, it's actually difficult to recognize here, and in fact, in the, in the gallery and looking at the painting, it's also very difficult to recognize, but uh, there is a possibility to enlarge these uh, uh, pictures. And then you will find that in uh, the various nodes here of uh, the network, practically um, the vertices of the network, you find uh, prominent names, mostly of politicians or of economical people. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, chairman of uh, bank uh, societies and all that sort of thing. And uh, the interesting point is uh, that all the information which is inside there, and which describes interaction, interactions between persons on the one hand and institutions on the other hand, that all this information is public. There is no secret information. I mean, nothing you would have difficulties to obtain. All of that is written in newspapers and everywhere. Everyone can actually access this information. But nobody does. Why? Because, it's, as you can see, it's very complex. Um, all the edges of the network 
which are collecting the vertices, they describe the type of interaction. Yeah? For instance, someone is uh, getting money from the other side or is depositing money in one of the banks or the bank is selling something to another bank or whatsoever. Yeah? All these types of interaction are classified and you can recognize by observing the type of connection of the edge of the diagram <laughs> and what kind of interaction is actually taking place. And as you can clearly recognize, for one simple case, that is one simple bank office, uh, of course a large society acting worldwide, obviously, um, for uh, one simple institution, you have a very complex network already, and uh, you find very interesting names. For instance, uh, you have a close connection in these uh, networks between a former president called Mr. Bush and um, uh, not a former president who is called Bin Laden. Yeah? And, uh, or, for instance, you can see that the same Mr. Bush is connected via various stations to other people who uh, sell weapons to the Iran. Yeah, you might remember that the President of the United States is not very happy about selling weapons to Iran. But nevertheless, the people he is related to by this network are actually belonging to the same group of people. Yeah? You see, uh, the important point is that you can learn two things. So it's uh, perhaps now uh, so bright to recognize so this. Can you uh, to, uh, take the number two? Yes. Uh, what you can learn here, that is a uh, magnification of a part of the diagram. You see, and uh, you have here um, uh, various uh, persons and uh, banks and actually of course all these names are worldwide uh, and remember that a network is functioning according to the small world model meaning that um, a neighbor in that network is represented by one interaction step yeah? so that for instance, for yourself, all the people you know personally are one step away in that similar network, while all the people known by the people you know, they are two steps away, but it's not necessary that you yourself know them, yeah? you see? So this actually produces a very short chain of interactions such that for the whole planet, each person is connected, connected with all the other persons by maximally six stations. Yeah? So you see that this is simply a small world network, what you see here, connecting in that case, connecting people from the oil industry in the United States to certain bank consortia who are acting uh, worldwide to certain political groups organizing certain aspects. And um, in fact, uh, this type of painting was the first painting ever where people of the CIA came into the gallery, into the arts gallery in New York in order to check information they did not actually have. <laughs> so that is a very, uh, very important event in the history of arts. Yeah, unfortunately it's not quite clear whether uh, the death of the artist is actually related to his activities. Um, so, as that is very often the case, nothing can be proven. Um, but there's another important point to these networks, namely demonstrating that people do not act in political terms in the form of conjuring themselves. You see, we do not have secret groups who are acting behind the curtains um, as a kind of um, 
the same secret government of all what happens on Earth, um, very often people think that uh, there are uh, cross connections all over the world by, uh, by various uh, people um, uh, coming from ancient times, you know, Templars or uh, other people who are organizing in secret and guiding mankind to a certain place. That is obviously not the case. And why is that so? Because the people connected by such networks are belonging to social groups who are not acting all together in a kind of collective conference, but they are acting according to what we call habitus. Um, habitus is of course a Latin word, but it's used in French, habitus, and it has been introduced by Pierre Bourdieu, one of the leading sociologists of recent times. And habitus is something which you acquire by socialization, yeah? just by belonging to a certain combination of social groups, you behave in a certain way. And all the others belonging to the same constellation behave similarly, but it is not necessary that you actually meet and uh, plan certain, uh, certain details or so. But habitus is a socialized property that is actually functioning automatically. And uh, you see that is a much more modern approach to the sociological structure of social groups than, uh, for instance, a full-fledged theory of secret conjuring could actually offer you. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, should suffice for um, uh, introducing you to the general problems. <coughs> So what I do, uh, will do these days is, first of all, uh, I begin in that way today, give you some introductory remarks about properties of systems. And uh, the example I'm discussing is an example which has medium complexity. It's not very complex as compared to social systems. And it's not too simple as compared with physical systems. Uh, it's a biological system actually, and it's uh, of medium-sized uh, complexity. Uh, it's actually the process of aggregation of slime molds, which was discussed in uh, 1970 uh, by Keller and Siegel for the first time. And uh, since then it has become a prominent example for uh, self-organizing processes and uh, the evolution of structure. And um, then I will give you some uh, other defining properties of systems and um, I will talk about uh, Petri nets, which is a particular form of networks working on a stochastic basis. And um, uh, then we will come to, uh, to the um, discussion of urban structures in the strict sense. So first of all, I quote uh, from the motto, because um, yeah, uh, unfortunately I'm afraid it's still to write here. So they need to, to bring something. Oh, I see. Yeah, they are preparing that. Um, so I will read you uh, this motto to all of uh, 
the topic, uh, which is of course um, somewhat of a joke, and namely it's a um, uh, passage from a novel of Geoffrey Eugenides, who is an uh, uh, American of Greek descent, and he lived actually uh, quite a long time in Berlin, uh, that is my hometown. And uh, the novel is called The Marriage Plot. It has been published in 2011. And I uh, quote from, um, the, from a talk between the female uh, student protagonist and uh, her friend. And they are talking about uh, the grammatology of Derrida. I quote, when Madeleine asked what the book the grammatology was about, she was given to understand by Whitney that the idea of a book being about something was exactly what this book was against. And that if it was about anything, then it was about the need to stop thinking of books as being about things. Madeline said that she was going to make coffee, and Whitney asked if she would make him some too. Yeah. So this uh, shall give you a first impression uh, of the depth of uh, our topic here. So now, what, uh, what we do in the beginning is that we quote from one of the first definitions given by Jean Piaget, who was actually a Swiss scientist but working in France most of the time and uh, dealing with uh, psychology mostly but also with epistemological questions. So here we are. And uh, in order to start that, I should uh, remind you of the etymological origin of the word system. Um, well, uh, if you cannot actually recognize it now, then um, you might read it um, in, in your own copy. Um, what page is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just the beginning of the first part, um, and it's on the title page. I have collected the original definition of the word coming from Greek, systelo, which means to order and to arrange together. Um, and that is the most general definition you can actually have. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, the detailed explanation is in German here because what I used was in fact one of the famous dictionaries of uh, ancient Greek and uh, German uh, published by Mr. Menge in 1903, which is very famous in Germany and a very uh, uh, detailed explanation. But uh, so the original meaning of Sistello is uh, to order together or to arrange together uh, and um, to combine something in that sense. So Piaget, who published um, uh, his famous work on structuralism in 1968, um, he uh, has um, two definitions and I will quote uh, from the original and I will translate it uh, immediately. En première approximation, une structure est un système de transformation qui comporte des lois en tant que système et qui se conserve ou s'enrichit par le jeu même de ces transformations. So uh, what that means in first approximation, the structure is a system of transformations. Note that interestingly, that is the other way around. Yeah? So what Piaget does is he actually defines a structure because uh, we are living here in 1968 in the times of structuralism, French structuralism. But it's uh, important to, to realize that in the French um, development of structuralism, it was in fact the other way around. Because structuralism originates in 
the theory of linguistics created by Saussure. Saussure was also of Swiss uh, descent and he developed the first theory of linguistics. Now the important point is that he never utilized the expression structure. He only utilized the expression system. And the system of a language was very much what we have called here a system of coordinates. It was a systematics introduced into the topic. Some, uh, that was about 1900. Some 30 years later, there was a famous international conference on linguistics in Paris, and then someone who summarized the work of Saussure introduced the expression structure, but in the sense of a property of systems. So, system has a structure. Yeah, that is the idea. So, in fact, if you look at the system in detail, you can actually locate a number of structures which are typical for this special system. So, structure is nothing autonomous. It's actually a part of a system. So, in fact, structuralism in the sense of French philosophy should have been called systemism or something like that, yeah? because it's actually dealing with systems which have a structure, but not with structures as such. But uh, in the meantime, people have that forgotten, of course, and therefore, if you talk now about people like uh, Michel Foucault or others, you relate to them, uh, or Levi Strauss, of course, uh, you rel relate to them as being structuralist. But you should bear in mind that this is the first modern application of the concept of system in philosophy and of course in the related sciences. The ancient use of system is uh, actually going back to Spinoza because uh, Spinoza who explains that the world as it really is can be described as a substance which has an infinity of attributes. For him, for Spinoza, the system is actually in the attribute because human beings, according to him, utilize two possible attributes, namely matter and mind, in order to describe what they can observe. And you see that is very similar to what we utilize when we invent certain systems, for instance coordinate systems, namely instruments of describing what we actually observe in order to deduce certain further properties from the results. But all the time, and this is also true for systems and for structures of systems, we are not dealing with reality as such, but we are only dealing with modality. So the concept of system is a human invention. Yeah? There are no systems in nature, because nature is not bothering whether there is a system or not. You see, nature is not bothering whether you have geodesics, but nature is acting according to the principle of least action. But this is not important for nature, but it's important for us because whilst knowing that nature is operating according to certain principles we have invented, it simply means that we are not on the wrong side of the description. So that it suffices to have a very simple set of equations in order to summarize the totality of classical physics. These are actually called the Euler-Lagrange equations. And um, you can summarize in one expression, which is a Lagrangian function, uh, it's actually an integral functional, uh, you can summarize all what there is. Yeah. So, but this is not because nature would have an interest in being so simple that uh, nature can be summarized in a set of equations. 
It's simply that we, as part of nature, are constituted such that for us it is useful to do so. Yeah? So, if you have results about systems or structures, you will have to be careful in applying these results because you cannot be sure whether that is useful or not only because it's belonging to your system. You have to check what part of the solution is relevant and useful for the evolution of the whole system as you can visualize it. <coughs> So the second uh, definition utilized here, uh, of course in the same book, it's, we are actually in the beginning of that book, uh, Strukturalismus from uh, 1968, is uh, further cl clarification, or second approximation, uh, in second approximation, il peut s'agir d'une phrase bien rétérieure aussi, bien, et so weiter. Um, um, uh, seulement, il faut bien comprendre, uh, in any case, it should be understood uh, very well, que cette formalisation est l'œuvre de théoricien, that this formalization is a work of the theoretician, not of nature. Tandis que la structure est indépendante de lui, although the structure is independent of him, et que cette formalisation peut se traduire immédiatement en équation logico-mathématique. And uh, this formalisation can be translated immediately into uh, equations of a logical and mathematical type. <coughs> so important is that uh, our type of formalization is something which is special to our means of observation or our uh, perception so that we represent the world as we see it, but we do not represent the world as it actually is. Okay, now um, coming to the um, of course, in that uh, passage you can read much more about Piaget, but I will not bother you with that now. But in, it should be in any case, uh, if you are interested in these origins of the concept of system, it should be very useful to read uh, at least this one book of uh, Jean Piaget, who has actually written very many of these books. So, yeah, well, it uh, obviously needs some time in order to get rid of this otherwise uh, well greeted sun. I was actually very happy because uh, in Berlin we have now minus 8 degrees during the day and minus 16 degrees by night, so this is much better. Unfortunately, not in all cases. So, um, now we come more to the we come more to the uh, detailed exposition of what the system is. Um, independent of the development of philosophy, which uh, was not actually observed very much, uh, very much by um, by mathematicians or physicists uh, or so. Um, uh, there was one utilization of this concept uh, which actually originated in mathematics in the 19th century. And uh, this is um, the uh, origin of the concept of system in the strict sense. Namely, it means a mathematical system. And it's actually called a dynamical system. And a dynamical system <coughs> is simply something like that. <coughs> you have the time derivative of 
sum function. And this x here is to be understood as a vector, yeah? So it's not only one variable, but in fact it's a collection of a large number of variables. Yeah? Uh, normally you would actually underline that, but uh, on the blackboard that is not very practical. So uh, you have to be in mind that x is actually a vector. Now, uh, dx by dt is simply the time derivative. The time derivative means that you describe the rate of change in a given time interval. Yeah? dx means that is a little, a small change as compared to a smaller time interval. And if you do that properly, then uh, you can do what you can not normally do, namely you can approximate the dynamical behavior on curves which are not straight lines. Because for straight lines uh, that is very easy and you might remember from your school that you have the theorem of Pythagoras for instance uh, which uh, gives you uh, in school fashion uh, gives you a certain point in coordinates x and y yeah, that are called Cartesian coordinates, of course, and uh, you see that this is then the y coordinate and this is the x coordinate for this point. And um, now, if you take the distance from the origin to that point and call that s, then you can actually describe this distance by Pythagoras as s squared is x squared plus y squared. Yeah, that is what you should know from school. Now, the point is, however, that, and this is not told to you at school, uh, that you can generalize that very easily in order to describe what Einstein called special relativity theory, because this here, I repeat this for simplicity. If this is true, this is also true for three dimensions, yeah? where z is the third coordinate into space. <coughs> and if that is true, then this is also true if the coordinates are of differential size, which means they are very small as compared to what you usually observe. The advantage is that you can pretend that in a very small interval you can apply the theorem of Pythagoras which you normally cannot if the curve is not a straight line, you see. But uh, in order to reproduce the original distance, what you have to do is simply uh, you have to sum up all these small parts and uh, sum in mathematics is in a posh way is, is written as an integral, you see. So the integral means you are summing over all possible small ds's and what you get is your original curve, you see. So, but the point is if you now introduce motion, here is no motion that is simply x, y, z coordinates in a space without anything at all. But if you introduce motion, what you do is, you remember that the velocity is defined as the first derivative of the distance according to time, ds by dt. And if you take a special motion, which is very interesting, namely the motion of light, then you know that this velocity is constant and it's actually maximal, namely 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, if this is true, you can actually write the S is C dt, and therefore C squared dt squared is also the S squared, you see. Now, if this left hand side is equal to the S squared, and this right hand side is equal to the S squared, then obviously they are equal themselves. So c squared dt squared minus the x squared minus the y squared minus the z squared is zero. 
And what you have here now is, surprise, surprise, four dimensions. Yeah, you have a space of dimensions x, y, z, t. And that is a space, what we call a Minkowski space, that is responsible for the special theory of relativity. And I will very shortly, I will show you that. This equation is the analytical expression for a geometrical form, which is a double cone. That looks so. And this coordinate is t, and this is all the others, x, y, z. Yeah, that is space. So you see, you have a double cone because this is in quadratic expression, and therefore you have two solutions, plus solution, minus solution. This is a plus solution. This is a minus solution, and here is the origin, and t is running upwards, so this is past, this is future. <coughs> and this is a universal expression for all what there is. So particles which are slower than light, moving inside the cone, particles which have the velocity of light, not only photons, but also neutrinos, for instance, move at the edge because this boundary is defining the cone and all the other particles which are forbidden, particles moving faster than light, they would move outside the cone. And because they are moving outside the cone, they are not covered by causality, you see. Uh, now, the point is that this looks, of course, a little magical, you see, but the point is that it is very practical and it can explain very easily very curious phenomena which are actually concrete physical phenomena. Namely, if you imagine that you are on the planet Earth <clears throat> and you are sending a spacecraft to a neighboring planet say the planet of the star Sirius. Actually, Sirius unfortunately has no planets, but we pretend. Yeah. So, here is Sirius and the planet. Yeah. Of course, not, you are not landing on Sirius itself, but on the planet. And um, then you are actually uh, moving there. Um, and uh, then you are actually coming back to the Earth. Yeah. So, now imagine you would have twins, yeah, twin boys, and uh, one boy is becoming astronaut and the other one is staying on Earth. Yeah, he is uh, more for sitting uh, at the desk, you know, that is uh, like myself. Uh, and uh, um, so what we know about the Earth is that the Earth is actually not moving. Yeah, that, that will be somewhat of a surprise because you know that the Earth is rotating around itself and it's rotating around the Sun and together with the Sun it's rotating around the galactic center and together with the galaxy it's rotating around the center uh, of the galaxy, of the local group of galaxies and so on and so on. But all these motions are inertial motions and according to the Newtonian first axiom this is actually the same as being not in motion, being at rest, because inertial motion means that nothing happens um, in terms of forces. So, um, in fact, in space, Earth is not moving, but nevertheless, Earth is moving in time because it's becoming older. Uh, so, and we know actually up to the return, because we know that the distance is actually to Sirius is nine light years. So, if we pretend that the spacecraft is flying with a velocity of light, uh, not making any acceleration, deceleration phases and all that, we neglect this. And of course, people would not return immediately because that would not be worthwhile, yeah, but nevertheless, uh, if we only think of the pure travel time, then in fact from start to end this will be 18 years elapsed on Earth. So 
for the twin on earth, it happens that the twin brother on earth has become 18 years older until the return of his twin brother. But for the spacecraft which is going to Sirius and back, this is not true. Why is it so? Because it's also moving in space. But it's roughly moving on the edge of the light cone. Yeah? And now notice that the sign of the spatial coordinates is different from the sign of the time coordinate. This is not true in the original spatial diagram because plus, 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 all is the same. But here you have plus, minus, minus, minus. In other words, if you have a normal triangle, then this side plus this side is always larger than the rest. Uh, they are actually, in one case, they are equal, but only if you press all of them together, which is trivial. Yeah? <clears throat> but because of the change of sign, in that case, it's the other way around. So, in fact, this is together, in terms of travel time, extremely shorter than the rest. And, in fact, uh, by some manipulation, which is called Lowell's transformation, but which I will not uh, tell you, uh, you can actually find the result. <clears throat> the time actually elapsed in the spacecraft is equal to the time elapsed on Earth times the correction factor. And the correction factor is 1 minus v square over c square, where v is the velocity of the spacecraft and c is the velocity of light. So if the spacecraft is almost moving with the velocity of light, you see 1 minus almost 1 means a very small root. And the very small root is multiplied to t naught and therefore the resulting time is very small as compared to the time on Earth. But if the velocity is a normal velocity, yeah, take an airplane uh, flying with 900 kilometers uh, per hour, then uh, v squared over c squared is practically zero, and therefore the root is one, and therefore the time in the aircraft is equal to the time on Earth, almost. Yeah. In fact, there is a colleague in Munich who was on the space shuttle once, and he has calculated that he is one millionth of a second younger than he should be. Yeah? <laughs> That's not very important, unfortunately. So, um, in other words, if you assume that the spacecraft is flying with a velocity of 99.99% .99 of the velocity of light, then whilst one twin brother has become 18 years older, the other twin brother on the spacecraft is only three days older. Yeah. And why is that relevant in biological terms? Because that is nothing but the oscillation of elementary particles and we are actually made out of elementary particles and therefore this is a real age. Yeah. He is really much younger than his twin brother. Okay, that was it for an excerpt. <clears throat> so, now what you see, that is what you can do with a dynamical system. Dynamical means simply that you have a rate of change in time. And that is of course very interesting because you would like to deal with processes and all that sort of thing, and therefore um, you are dealing with what we call differential equations. Of course, in the meantime, uh, we have found out that unfortunately nature is not happening really much according to differential equations, but rather to very complicated discrete, discrete fractal processes which are difficult to describe and you cannot actually describe them by differential equations because 
these equations are based on the axiom of continuity and unfortunately nature is not continuous. But nevertheless, for a large class of problems, that is still a very good instrument to apply and uh, therefore uh, we will actually utilize uh, the example accordingly. And uh, the dynamical system uh, we look at is what I already announced. This is um, the system of slime molds. And, um, uh, <coughs> Actually, much more complex is about the computer. Yeah. So, um, Here I show you first of all what we are actually talking about before I'm writing down the equations. So what we see here uh, is actually an evolutionary cycle and it's uh, very interesting, it's very simple. It was actually discovered in 1970. It was uh, published in a journal which at that time was very new, namely dealing with mathematical aspects of biology. And uh, Evelyn Keller and uh, her colleague Siegel were publishing this very famous uh, article. And uh, what you see here is actually a type of amoebae, which is uh, consisting of one, essentially of one biological cell. Uh, so it's a very uh, simple microorganism. But it's a very old one, much older than humankind on this planet, you see, because they might be simple, but they are very stable, you see. And uh, the point is the following. What you have, or what you start with in the top, is a system of amoebae that communicate with each other. In fact, what they do is they swarming uh, a plain surface, and they are looking, of course, that is the main profession of, uh, of living beings. They look for something to eat. Uh, and they, they feed on uh, organisms which are still much smaller than themselves, obviously. But the point is that once they have detected uh, a source of energy, of uh, food, what they do is they um, sent a hormone out uh, and the other amoebae are following the gradient of the chemical concentration of that hormone, which um, we uh, will talk uh, about later. I mean, what kind of hormone that is. <clears throat> so uh, what happens is that uh, these amoebae actually aggregate after a while because what you have initially is you have an equidistribution of amoebae and uh, in mathematical terms that is a kind of symmetry so they are somehow distributed over space then suddenly uh, a food source is located and uh, then there begins a migration, the directed migration such <coughs> that um, this hormone which is called pheromone um, is utilized as a medium of communication, maybe such that it's a signal for food and the gradient, which means actually the gradient of the con concentration. You might remember from school that the gradient is a vector whose components consist of derivatives according to the coordinates of space. So in other words, what you measure when you are computing the gradient is you measure the steepest ascent of concentration in x, y and z direction. And uh, so by doing so you get a general direction of the steepest ascent of the concentration and that is simply 
um, the direction all the other Möwe are following. And that is uh, their means of communication in chemical terms. In fact, very many insects are communicating in chemical terms. Uh, ants, for instance. Yeah. So, then, once they have arrived, of course, they start to feed. Yeah, quite clear. But then, unfortunately, that is an old energy law, the food is finished. What starts that is starvation. Yeah, there is not enough food. So what, what are they doing? They are not redistributing again, but what they are doing is they accumulate. That is, they come together and build out of their organisms, they build a new higher organism, which is the slime mold. It's over various stages, it's looking like a slime, you know, a very uh, large body as compared to a single nerve. And um, so you could argue that what they are actually doing is they accumulate in order to create a collective organism that simply consists of very many amoebae in order to have a bus service. Yeah? They have a medium of transport because the slime mold can move much quicker than the singular amoebae and therefore in a short while they are in another region where there is more food. Yeah? And then if the body has arrived there happens the phase of germination. That means that the slime mold is expulsing all these spores again which are forming new amoebae and then the cycle is starting once more. Obviously the slime mold or the amoebae which form the slime mold are not identical with the spores who form the new amoebae. So it's not actually a cycle, it's a spiral. Yeah? And um, so you end up with a lot of slime molds and with a lot of amoebae of different types. And this is obviously self-organizing. Now, in, uh, in order to describe this, You write this as a set. Uh, uh, you write this as a set of equations in the sense of a dynamical system, and this is shown here on the top of the page. I'm not quite sure whether you can actually decipher this, uh, but I can read you this. Small a is actually the uh, density of the amoebae, which means the number density, number of amoebae per um, surface unit. And rho, the Greek letter rho, is standing for the chemical concentration of the pheromone, which is the communication hormone. So you see on the left hand side you have the time derivatives, meaning the rate of changes in time of the concentrations of amoebae and of the pheromone, dA by dt and dr, uh, dRho by dt, and um, this is written in terms of open Ds because uh, you have partial derivatives, not total derivatives. On the right hand side, you have the mixed expressions uh, um, presenting the gradient. As I said, the gradient is a vector operator uh, whose components are the directional derivatives with respect to x, y, z. So the first term, which is the... Uh, oh, by the way, you, you might notice that if you 
in, the, in the case of a vector, you have always a scalar product, and that means you take the product of the gradient with itself. And if you do that, what you get is the sum of the second derivatives. And that is simply the uh, wave operator, the Laplace operator. And if you introduce time, you get wave-like equations. Yeah? So the first term is the Laplace form, uh, gradient on gradient, of uh, the production of pheromone with respect to um, the amoebe. And D1 is a rate constant, which is called um, uh, the chemotactic coefficient that gives you practically the coupling or the strength of the uh, interaction which is caused by the production of this pheromone. And the second term is simply giving you uh, a similar concentrational value on the amoebe because obviously what you are describing here is the interaction of the amoebae, is communication among amoebae, and therefore you have to uh, introduce a second coefficient which is giving you the strength of that type of interaction. In the second equation, where you have the rate of change of the pheromone, you have in the beginning production and annihilation terms, which means that obviously. Um, the uh, pheromone is produced and annihilated according to the available amoebe. These are the first three terms. In fact, uh, it's a bit more complicated because the, the reaction is not a direct reaction, but it's uh, reacting via the instrument of forming a chemical complex, but uh, this shall not uh, bother us. And on the right hand side you have again the Laplace operator which is uh, gradient times gradient of the concentration of the pheromone and that is a diffusion term. It means that it's measuring the velocity with which the pheromone is disappearing again. Yeah? Because if it's diffused long enough then of course no amoeba will find it again. Yeah? And this set of two equations, actually originally they are four equations, but two of them you can get rid of by mathematical reasons. And so you are end up with two equations. These two equations can be summarized as a dynamical system, yeah, because if you, uh, if you uh, define the vector, uh, we had x in terms of two components, A and Rho, then both of these equations can be written in this form, yeah? only that you have partial derivatives here. <clears throat> so, these two equations form a dynamical system, in the mathematical sense, such that they completely describe the model which is representing the interaction taking place in that uh, evolutionary cycle of America. Yeah. Um, uh, as you can clearly see, this system unfortunately cannot be solved, yeah, because uh, this is always the case. Um, if the um, equations are nonlinear, there is a very fundamental theorem in mathematics telling you that if you have linear differential equations, then you have one unique complete solution and this solution can be composed out of two partial solutions or two particular solutions as a sum of the two. But if you have a nonlinear system, then this means that there is an infinity of solutions and unfortunately you have to guess which of the solution is useful and which one is not useful. Uh, but uh, you cannot uh, solve that by hand. Yeah? So what you do instead is you concentrate on the critical points of the dynamical system. And this is very easy to understand because it reminds you again on what you learned at school. Namely a critical point is what 
for the special case of functions of one variable, which we have mostly at school, uh, you call extremal points, yeah? minima, maxima, settle points. These are critical points of functions, but only for the case that the function has one variable. But we have very many variables. So for a general system, the critical point is defined for the x0, that is the set of variables for which f, that is the right hand side, f of x and t is vanishing. That is uh, equivalent to what you learn at school when you say that you find extremal points if you put the first derivative equal to zero. But uh, here you do actually the same. What you put to zero is the first derivative according to time, um, and the right hand side then vanishes, and you have an equation, of course. Uh, in fact, you have n equations for n components of x. And you have to solve them in order to determine the critical points. But the function of the critical points is the same. They are extremal points, meaning minima, maxima, and all that sort of thing. So uh, the basic ideas now, instead of solving a system which you cannot actually solve, what you do is you describe the whole system in terms of the critical points plus a very small, that is expressed by epsilon, which is small but positive, by a very small perturbation in the vicinity of the critical point, and then you solve the equation for this rest term, which is called here x twiddle. And uh, this is shown uh, in the lecture notes in more detail. And this is actually uh, a very old method going back to Henri Poincaré in the 19th century. This is actually the same method by which he can show that the solar system is unstable, although the sun is actually shining for quite a while. So what you do is, you see, if you put the right hand side of the dynamical system equal to zero, then you see what is written here in the first line. This is a resulting equation and you have to solve for, eight, uh, for a zero and for rho zero, which are the critical uh, points. Uh, now, linearization of the nonlinear system means that for a sufficiently small neighborhood of the critical points, you get the perturbation ansatz, which looks like A is equal to A naught, that is the critical point, plus epsilon, which is a small term, A bar of x, y, t, and accordingly for rho you do the same. So, what you then actually apply is what in, in uh, elementary calculus is called a Taylor expansion. You uh, develop the function up to the first term, that is practically your linear term. And if you do so, then uh, the point is that the result, that is the value you get for a bar and rho bar, is called unstable if the solution diverges with, with uh, t to infinity. So if you, that is a Lemus term here, Lemus limit means that uh, t is approaching infinity, it's becoming larger and larger and larger, and if you look for a bar and rho bar such that for a long while t going to infinity, both of these terms go themselves to infinity, so that means they grow without any limits, then you can say the result is unstable. And in fact, <coughs> this constellation is what you're looking for, because you see, when the amoebae break their symmetry, namely they start accumulation, then this is the same as an unstable point in the dynamical evolution of the amoebae distribution. Yeah. So what you do is, 
you try to determine the A bar and rho bar such that you find instability or the unstable state going to infinity and this means that you have found a condition on the symmetry breaking, meaning a condition on the Amoe Bay in order to start the accumulation of a slime mold. Yeah? And so what you see from this approach is that the formation of structure which happens in self-organizing systems is technically a result of going over critical points, that is of uh, perturbing the original solution in the vicinity of uh, such a critical point so that in the end something is coming out which is a new solution as compared to the old solution and this is what we call formation of structure because something new has actually emerged because the slime mold organism with respect to the distribution of amoebae is actually a new structure which is showing up. Of course it's not new in the sense that biology would not have met it any, at any time. Yeah? I mean it's not uh, new as a new idea, but on the structural level it's new with respect to the structure which was there before. And in that sense it's actually innovation, yeah? it's a new structure. So what I would then show you, and I think this will be a good close, is a little trick, <laughs> because uh, that is, uh, uh, I like this very much, although it's perhaps in mathematical terms, it's somewhat questionable, but it's very nice, um, because the equations I've shown you at the beginning, perhaps uh, I should be mind you once more. Of course you can, you can read them in the lecture notes. On. We see these equations on the top of the page. They can be rewritten as a matrix equation because as I said before, if you take A and rho as two components of a vector, then you can rewrite this in vectorial form. And then you define the following. You have one component which consists of the first gradient and the second component. And you see I'm only writing the operator. I'm not writing the entry of the operator because that is not important. Uh, of course the entry must be rho and a. And then the two equations can be summarized as a matrix equation. Capital E is a matrix and X is a vector. And the vector consists of rho and A. And the matrix consists of the operator entries which are written above. You see, if you apply matrix multiplication, I mean, you multiply the matrix with a vector, then you get simply the two equations back. Yeah. So it's uh, nothing but a rewriting of the original equations. We have not changed anything substantial. Now remember that the formation of structure now is practically a transition, namely a transition between two states, namely the old state and the new state. Yeah. So what you do is that you have a transition from E to E star, which means from the stable old state to the unstable state, because you need the unstable state in order to trigger the accumulation process. So obviously the whole cycle consists of two transitions, namely stable old state to unstable state and then into a new stable state. Yeah? So you have three parts of this type. So I call the first state E 
described by the matrix. I call the second E star and the third I call E double star. So formation of structure means a transition from E to E double star via E star, which is necessary. And um, you see the point is that uh, this is always true for matrices because the matrix in the differential equation or the system of differential equations is actually giving you the coefficients. And the coefficients are important, but the other entries of the variables are not important because they are always the same. Yeah, so it depends on the quality of the coefficients what the differential system is actually doing all the time. So uh, this is a reason why you can describe this alternatively in terms um, of um, matrices. And now what I do is I call the first transition negation because essentially the old stable state is negated by the further development in favor of a new state. Likewise, the unstable state is negated by the new stable state. Yeah. So what you have is the negation of a negation. And therefore, what you have here is a very simple illustration of a dialectical system in terms of differential equations. Because the proposition is the first stable state you observe. The first negation is the unstable state which is confronted with it. The second negation is a new stable state and remember the definition of the negation in any terms, for instance in terms of Hegel, it is what we call sublation, meaning that the old state is conserved. This is obviously the case because from the new state you can read the old state, although it's not more effective in biological terms. It is also raised on a higher level. That is obviously the case because an organism of slime mold is on a higher biological level than a simple amoebae. And it is also, um, what have I forgotten? Uh, it's, um, oh, and uh, it's abolished in the sense that the effectiveness of the old state is not more valid because the new state is now effective. So you have all the three Hegelian uh, definitions for the sublation and dialectical terms as described in terms of a negation of negation. The difference is simply that here it's a logical operator at the same time. So you can actually define an algebra by this. And this means that you can apply this very nicely to modern category theory in mathematics. But in terms, if you read Marx and Engels, you could not possibly do it. Uh, Yeah, I think um, this is enough material for a little introduction into the topic. And um, uh, of course, I would like very much if you um, if you ask certain questions you might have, and um, possibly you have a question later or so. Then, of course, we can continue a discussion probably during the meal or. Uh, we can, uh, can meet uh, a bit later. At the end of the session, after the fourth part, we will have a final discussion where all open questions can once more be discussed in more detail. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>